so far in class, we've assumed that reactions happen in a single step, whether we've said this explicitly or not. And we've said that, you know, if we have a reaction like A plus B goes to C, that um, this is the only reaction that happens. And as a consequence, we get rate laws like RA equals minus K1 times CA times CB, right? And we said that this is elementary. But not all elementary um, or not all reactions are elementary. And in fact, having one reaction that happens in a single step is very, very rarely the case. And there's a lot of different ways to get to this stoichiometry. So let's, you know, let's just talk about two pathways that you might be able to get A plus B goes to C. All right, so if we have these two pathways, the first one is that A might react with B and form some intermediate that we'll call A star, and then A star reacts and becomes C. And if you look at this, the overall reaction, right, these cancel, is still A plus B goes to C. Another way that this could happen is say, you know, A reacts, makes some intermediate A star, A star plus B reacts to give you B star, and then B star reacts to give you C. And if we look at this one, right, the A stars cancel, the B stars cancel, and we still get A plus B goes to C. And it's important to know that almost all reactions have multiple elementary steps that make a mechanism, right? And that's a word that we're gonna talk about a lot towards the end of the semester, where a mechanism is a series of elementary steps that facilitates a reaction, right? Like we normally would write, A plus B goes to C. And every reaction or almost every reaction consists of elementary steps that include, you know, single reactions, bond breakage, et cetera. But almost all of them involve a single electron transfer. Remember, reactions are essentially the exchange of electrons between, um, between species. And so almost every step involves an electron transfer of some kind. Now, one of the things that we have to think about is if we have these long mechanisms, that not every step has the same intrinsic rate. So some of these steps are slower than other steps. And that step, or there's one step in every reaction that is the slowest step. And we call that step the rate determining step. or RDS for short. And the rate determining step is going to determine whether we have an elementary reaction or not most of the time, okay? And today, I wanna talk through this maybe at a very surface level and just give a couple examples and do a little bit of math that shows you how this can get implemented to give us either elementary reaction mechanisms or not. But the real point of it is to stress to you that just because you see a reaction, A plus B goes to C, does not mean that it will behave this way in your reactor. So we have to measure the apparent reaction order using experimental data. And that'll be the end of the lecture today. So we're going to spend you know, about half of this lecture doing a little bit of math, showing why mechanisms uh, may or may not lead to elementary reaction orders. And then we'll spend time towards the end of the lecture actually showing how you would determine the order for a specific reaction, okay? So let's think about this um, using pathway one over here, okay? So let's take this um, reaction pathway. And in this pathway, there's two steps, right? A plus B goes to A star and A goes to C. Now, I, I wrote both of them this way, right? But we have this overall reaction, A plus B goes to C. Now, one of the things that we know is that the rate determining step is the slowest step. 
So if the rate determining step is um, the slow step, we know that because this reaction is irreversible, for this particular reaction, that is gonna be irreversible. But the other steps can be in equilibrium, right? So all other steps in the mechanism can be reversible. And what that means from our perspective is that if the first step is the rate determining step, we would have A plus B goes to A star, right? That would be the rate determining step, right? So let's say this is the rate determining step. Well, then the second step could be in equilibrium. So we could have A star is in equilibrium with C. Or if the second step was the rate determining step, A plus B could be in equilibrium with A star, and then A would go to C, right? And this could be the rate determining step. And we don't know beforehand. Now, to be complete here, I'm gonna write the rate constant. So that would be K1, that would be K2, um, that would be K minus two. In the mechanism here on the right, that would be K1, K minus one, and that would be K2. And so the question here is how would the mechanism and which step is the rate determining step actually impact our rate law? Because remember the first step when we're trying to determine um, or to solve our mole balance, to determine the concentrations, et cetera, as a function of time, the first thing we always do is to develop a rate law. Well, remember each step in the mechanism is elementary. So let's say that these are the only two steps. Well, in our first mechanism here on the right, right? So we'll deal with this and maybe I'll just draw a line down the middle that our first step in this mechanism or the rate law for A, I'm sorry, would be minus RA is equal to K1 times CA times CB. And so this would look exactly like we had before if the first step was the rate determining step and that was irreversible. So this doesn't look like there's a lot that changed, but how would this impact the rate law if the second step was the rate determining step? So let's do this on the right-hand side of our screen. So if the second step is the rate determining step, well, one of the things that we know is that the rate of A over the stoichiometric coefficient for A for the overall reaction is equal to the rate of C over the stoichiometric coefficient for C. And you might think, well, why did I write that? Well, we could write a rate law for C and we know that C is equal to K2 times the concentration of A star, right? We would form C through the second reaction and it only moves in one direction. And so we know here that RA over minus one equals RC over one. So RA equals minus RC. So that means that the rate of reaction for A is equal to minus K2 times CA star, or sometimes your book writes it a little bit, um, writes it a little bit differently, and that it actually says minus RA is equal to K2 times CA star. All right, so what we would need to do then is ask ourselves that if we feed A and B to the reactor and we make C, we might never measure A star. That, that might exist on a surface or it might be a very short-lived intermediate in the solution. So how can we find the concentration of A star? Well, we can do that from this equation at the top because we know for step one that the rate of reaction, right, for reaction one is equal to K1 times CA times CB minus K minus one times C A star. And if it's in equilibrium, 
the overall rate of that reaction is zero. And so we can solve for Ca star. So we know that Ca star would equal K1 over K minus one times Ca times Cb. So you can actually put that in that equation and find then that minus Ra is equal to K1, K2 over K minus one times Ca times Cb. And when we solve this type of problem really extensively, we're gonna spend you know, multiple weeks on this towards the end of the semester. Um, we're gonna end up writing this as minus Ra is equal to K prime times Ca times Cb, where K prime is actually an amalgam of all the stuff that's happening. And really, right, this is K1, the equilibrium constant times K2 times Ca times Cb. And so we have this rate law with the example that we gave and you think, well, those look exactly the same, but there are real fundamentals that are, that are different here because you have activation energies, you have thermo, you have all that stuff that's sort of buried um, in that reaction rate constant that we need to figure out. We also, um, we also can look at this um, a little bit differently and ask ourselves, you know, in a problem like this, we said, well, the rate of reaction one was equal to zero. But what if, and that led us down this pathway where we still had something that looked like an elementary reaction, but what if that wasn't necessarily the case? What if that reaction is not in equilibrium? What if we knew, let's say from like spectroscopy or something that you guys did in a chemistry class, that, that A star was extremely reactive? Well, what would that mean? I mean, what that would mean is that as soon as A was formed, it reacted, right? And so that would mean that the rate that you formed A star was essentially equal to zero, right? It was formed and reacted. The rate of reaction of A is zero because it forms and reacts at exactly the same rate. Well, what's the rate of A star using our mechanism? Let me just zoom out slightly so we can see it. Well, we form A star through this elementary step, right? K1 times Ca times Cb, and then it reacts in two different ways, right? Minus K minus one times Ca star, minus K2 times Ca star, right? That's just the mole balance on this intermediate. And we said that that thing is equal to zero. And so we can simplify this a little bit, right? This becomes that zero equals K1 Ca Cb equals, or here, let me do this first, minus, Ca star times K1, K minus one plus K2, okay? And we could actually solve for then the concentration of Ca star. So Ca star would be K1 Ca Cb over K1, or sorry, K minus one plus K2. And if that were the case, remember for our reaction that That was our rate. So we can actually plug this in and minus RA then for that case would be, remember it was K2 times CA. So it'd be K2 times K1 CA CB over K1, K minus one plus K2, which would be K2 times K1 over K minus one plus K2 times CA times CB, okay? So I know that this might not make, um, like this might not be natural from what you guys have done before. But the point that I'm trying to get across here is that reactions, real reactions are more complicated than occurring in a single step. And so the rate law for those reactions can also end up being more 
complicated. And I'll give you a very practical example, okay? So this is all kind of theory of stuff that we could think about, but let's do a real example with a real reaction. For this reaction, it's known that NO plus O2 gives us NO3 in equilibrium. So that's K1, K minus one. And then NO3 reacts with NO to give us K to give us NO2, there's two of those, irreversibly. Okay. And just to make sure that this works, right, the NO3 cancels. And our overall reaction is 2NO plus O2 gives us 2NO2. Now, as we go through the semester, I don't want for us to carry chemical symbols with us when we don't have to. Because if you look in the homework, for example, there's some really long formulas, and there's no sense to do that. So I like to write things in terms of like A, B, C, D, E, et cetera. So I'm going to write this reaction as A plus B is in equi equilibrium with A star, right? Where you don't even see NO3 in the overall reaction. So it's just like the intermediate that we discussed a minute ago. And then A star reacts with A to give us 2C, right? K1, K minus 1, K2, okay? And so the overall reaction here is 2A plus B gives us 2C, and hopefully that's okay. Now, what we can do here is look at the rate laws for all of the species. So let's develop a rate law for A, right? And if we develop that rate law, we know that it reacts in the first reaction, K1 times CACB plus K minus one times CA star minus K2 times CA times CA star. You can do the same thing for A star, right? That's formed by K1 CACB. It reacts. And then it also is consumed in the second reaction, K2 times CA times CA star. And then finally, we know that C is formed that you make two Cs and only in the second reaction, Ca times Ca star. And we also know from the overall reaction stoichiometry that this has to be true, right? And so that means in this reaction, because A and C both have a stoichiometry of two, one um, A is minus two, C is plus two, so that means that RA is equal to minus RC. So another way to write RA is that it's equal to minus two times K2 times CA times CA star. And let's make the exact same assumption that we made a minute ago um, in the previous uh, derivation. And let's assume that CA star is very reactive. And what that means is that that is equal to zero, right? That this equation is equal to zero. And we can do the exact same thing we did just a minute ago and then solve for CA star. And if we do that, we have zero equals K1 times CA times CB minus CA star times K1 plus K2 times CA, because remember this also has CA in it. And that means that CA star equals K1 CA times CB over K minus one plus K2 times CA. Well, this is actually very interesting. So now we have a rate law where RA is equal to two times K1 times K2 times CA squared CB over K minus one plus K2 times CA. And I got there, right, just by inserting CA star into that equation. Now we've never seen a rate law before that had a concentration in the denominator, but 
that gives us an opportunity to ask a question about our reaction. Well, what if the second reaction is very fast? So what if K2 times CA is much faster than K1, right? Or um, the second reaction actually proceeds, or at least the multiple actually proceeds faster than K1. Well, this rate law then would simplify very interestingly because then this would become, right? This would become zero, essentially, right? It would get dwarfed by K2 times CA. So this would become equal to 2K1, K2, CA squared CB divided by K2 times CA. Well, that would cancel with this. That would cancel with this. And that would give us 2 times K1, CA, CB. So here's an example where our elementary rate law that we saw just a minute ago would have assumed or would have gotten us to this point where minus RA equaled K1 times CA squared times CB. But when we know a little bit more about the mechanism, we're never gonna observe that experimentally. Maybe not never, but let's say that that were true. Another thing that we can think about is what if the concentration of B is way bigger than the concentration for A. Now, why would that matter in a process like this? Well, if CB was much, much bigger than the concentration of CA, if our reaction is 2A plus B goes to 2C, if, this, if CB is huge, and you'll see this in your homework, we have an example where the concentration of B is a hundred times the concentration of A, which you can do to push uh, conversion, any number of reasons, then the concentration of B is approximately equal to a constant. So let's take this example where, um, where this was true. And let's also have the concentration of B be also equal to a constant. So let's make both of these things true. Well, if CB is a constant, then minus RA equals 2K1 times CB, or for all intents and purposes, it's a constant, times CA, right? Well, this is kind of like K1 prime. And so we would find a rate law that is equal to We'll call this K1 prime times CA. So again, we would have thought based on the reaction that minus RA was equal to K1 CA squared times CB. But that, depending on the reaction condition and the fundamental properties of the reaction we are looking at, does not have to be the case. And therefore, we have to find the apparent reaction order for the process that we are interested in. And sometimes that means that regardless of what the rate law looks like or what the reaction looks like, we could have fractional orders. So for a reaction like this, we might say, well, minus RA was, let's say K1 times CA to its reaction order times CB to its reaction order. Well, these can be elementary, but they also can be fractions, right? And the most common fractions are, would be one half. Um, other fractions are weird and very complicated reaction mechanisms. Um, you also can have whole numbers that are greater than or equal to, or sorry, less than or equal to um, what you would expect from the elementary reaction. Okay, so before we do this, before we actually talk about how, would we, how we would determine this, I just wanna open it up for questions. I know we did a lot of math and really this was the point. We did all this math to show you guys 
that the reaction orders are not always what you would think of looking at the reaction. And we're going to dig into these mechanisms extensively later on in the semester. I just wanted to give you a little taste for it now. So does anybody want to ask a question before we uh, actually go about evaluating these? I have one. Yeah, sure. Um, the part where you said like, I think it was the previous example, we said like it was in equilibrium. So you set like R1 equal to zero. Mm -hmm. Detail that a little more. Yeah, uh, right. that's a really great question. Yeah, right when we got to here, yeah. What exactly is like R1? Ah, that's a good question. I apologize. This is a notation issue. Okay. So this is reaction one. And this is what I meant by reaction two. So when I wrote R1 here, yeah, this is a really great question. This is just the overall rate of that reaction, right? We're not targeting a specific component. We're actually asking ourselves, what's the rate of that reaction? And so the forward rate was K1 times CA times CB minus K minus one times CA. Okay. Yeah, does that make sense? Yes, and so you can always set that equal to zero if it's like an equilibrium. If it's an equilibrium. And, and remember, right, all equilibrium reactions really equilibrium is um, no change, right? Over time. Well, maybe that's steady state, but at equilibrium, certainly there's no change. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we can assume that the rate of this reaction is zero if it's in equilibrium. And you notice we're gonna do that later in the semester because mechanisms will get more and more complex. We're not just gonna have reacting steps. We're gonna have adsorption, desorption, other things that are happening where um, we're gonna end up at a place where we have four, five, six individual steps and one rate determining step. And sometimes depending on what's going on, we're gonna end up assuming that all of those other steps are in equilibrium. So we will dig into that extensively later. So, um, but hopefully this at least for now makes sense. And if we did have a ton of other steps, I would have also assumed that they were all in equilibrium. And I would have used that to find the concentration of all of the intermediates that aren't a part of this overall reaction. Okay. Okay. And like I said, yeah, we're gonna do a ton of this later on in the semester. All right, um, anybody else have questions? That was a really good one. Okay. Oh, someone came in and out. If you have a question, I'm happy to answer. Yeah, I just kind of want to clarify um, all of the different variables. Um, could you scroll up? Yeah. Sure. Like back to where you were, there was, he asked about the R1. Um, mm -hmm. Can you like differentiate between the RC and the RA? And the negatives also? Uh, so, well, okay. So the RC here is... So remember when we were solving problems before, right? Let's say we had A goes to B in the last lecture or the last or the lecture before that. So R with the subscript is the rate of reaction for species A. And so when I write R sub A, that's the rate of reaction for species A. And when I write R sub C, that is the rate of reaction for species C, right? And if we have A, B, and C in this process, we will have an R, A, R, B, and R, C. And the reason that we'll need that is, let's say in a batch reactor, we know that the mole balance is D, N, I, D, T is equal to, you know, let's just call it K times the concentration of A in this particular case, or maybe a better way to say this, is it's just gonna be Ri times the volume, right? That's the mole balance. And if we're gonna solve a mole balance for every individual species, we need a rate law for every individual species. And they won't all be the same. And you saw that here. So there's four species in this mechanism, in that one, right? There's A, B, A star, and C. And when we solve bigger problems, we will have to account for the rate law for each of those individual components. So that's a very good question. And that's what the, um, that's what the subscript is here, here. Um, and then when I did, uh, I did it later for 
uh, for B as well, I believe. So, so that's the subscripts. Um, the, the negatives in the reactions, right? Like um, this one, right? A negative in these equations, right? Like um, here and so on is always meant to indicate when something is being consumed because I probably should have left this a second ago, but remember D N I DT is equal to R I times V. So if something is consumed, its number of moles is going to decrease. And so that negative sign would be in this rate law to say that the concentration will go down, you know, according to this rate law. And when you have a plus sign, it indicates that you form it. Because remember, this term in, remember, we started with in minus out plus generation minus consumption equals accumulation. And this RIV term, so for a batch reactor, those all go away or those two go away. But for a batch reactor, this Ri times V is the generation and the consumption term. So when something is generated, it's a plus sign. When something is consumed, it's a minus sign. Okay. Thank Does, you. Um, yep. The last uh, variable that I wanna know about is, what does it mean when there's a negative subscript on like the Ks? Oh, that's just the reverse reaction. So here, for example, right, K1 here, here, maybe I'll use a different color. That's a little brighter here. But K1 here is the forward reaction rate constant. K minus one is the reverse reaction rate constant. Okay. So, yeah. And remember, those are related, right? So we did this in the last lecture, that K1 over K minus one is equal to the thermodynamic um, constant for that process, whether it's KP or KC, okay? All right, hopefully that helps. Anybody else have a question they want to ask before we move on? All right, good. Those were both two very good questions. So we spoke a couple minutes ago about the fact that you can't look at the rate law or the fact that you can't look at the overall reaction and know what the rate law looks like means that we have to experimentally determine the reaction order for our reaction of interest in operating conditions that are similar to what it is that we're actually wanting to do. And there are ways to do this. And those are all covered in chapter seven. And we're going to give, there are a lot of methods that are used to follow or to determine the reaction order. Like I said, those are in chapter seven. We're going to talk about two very, very common ones now. And, the, and if you know those two you're, you're good for 99% of the cases. So we're, we're just gonna talk about those. And all of them begin by measuring a reactant concentration versus time, okay? So we know that we have some reaction that is, you know, let's use a very simple one to maybe think through what we wanna do. And then on the homework, you guys will practice a slightly more complicated version. But let's just say that we had a reaction that was A goes to products. Okay. Now, first of all, as I said a second ago, the thing we're going to want to do is to, is to measure the concentration of A versus time. And if you think about how you would actually do this, this is why we make you guys take all those chemistry classes, because how would you measure the concentration of A? Well, one, you could do it with sensors, for example. Like you could measure the pH over time. Let's say that protons or hydroxide ions were one of the reactants or products. You also could uh, do sampling type analysis. You could do like GC, GC mass spec, um, high performance liquid chromatography, depending on the phase that you're operating in. So you could do gas phase chromatography, liquid phase chromatography, chromatography with or without mass spectroscopy. You can do all of these things to measure A as a function of time, okay? So let's say that we have this data, right? We're gonna have A as a function of time. Let's do a little bit of math to show how we could figure out what the reaction order is then using this data. All right, well, the first way or the first method is called the differential method. Okay. 
And in the differential method, we take advantage of the fact that we know in our mass balance that DNA DT is equal to minus K1 times CA to its reaction order times the volume. And let's just make things easy on ourselves for now and just say when the volume is constant, we just divide both sides by volume and get DCA DT is equal to minus K1 times CA to its reaction order, okay? So if we solve this problem, right, we actually take this, um, or if we go to solve this problem, maybe there's a couple ways that we could think about doing this. Well, the first one, is maybe move the minus to the other side and you'll see why we're gonna do that in a second. DCA DT equals K1 times CA to its reaction order, okay? And now what we're gonna do is take the natural log of both sides. And if we do that, we have the natural log of minus DCA DT is equal to the natural log, oops, sorry, the natural log of K1 times CA to its reaction order. And remember from logs, right? The natural log of A times B is just the natural log of A plus the natural log of B. So we can write this as the natural log of K1 plus the natural log of CA to its reaction order. And also remember another rule of logs is that the natural log of A to the B is just B times the natural log of A. And so we can write this as the natural log of minus DCA DT is equal to the natural log of K1 plus the reaction order for A times the natural log of the concentration of A. And if we think about how we would represent data, right? Data would look a lot like this, where we would have the concentration of A versus time, and we would have these increments of time here. So what we could do is look at the difference between these times, right? So here, right? Delta T is equal to 10 seconds, right? Right. And here the change in the concentration was about 0.11 molar. And we could do the same thing. So then Delta T for here is 20 seconds. And here it's 10 more seconds. And here we could look at the difference and look at our formula that we had here just a minute ago. So what we can do is over these 10 second intervals, we could calculate or estimate this from the natural log of minus delta CA over delta T. And that would equal the natural log of K1 plus the reaction order times the natural log of the concentration of A at the beginning of that step. So let's go back to here for a second. So one of the things that we can then do is calculate that integral or to calculate the thing that's in the log, which in for the first step would be 0 0.11 over 10 seconds would be approximately delta CA over delta T. And then we can do this for the second step as well. Well, that would be 0 0.77 over 10 seconds, right? And we would use the initial concentration of A to, um, for each one of those. And now we can plot it. And if we do that, here's the concentration of A as a function of time. But if you look at the plot on the right-hand side, this is this change that we just wrote, the minus the natural log of delta CA over um, delta T plotted versus the concentration, and we get a straight line. And the slope of that line is equal to the reaction order. And the intercept 
is equal to the natural log of, of K1. Now there's two ways to go about looking at this data. So the first one is to just take the raw data. So if we did that here in this example, we would say that, you know, in our example one that I just showed, then the slope was equal to 2.05. And we would say the intercept was equal to minus 4.29. And if we looked at that, well, we know the slope is equal to the reaction order and the intercept is the natural log of K1 for that plot, right? So we plotted minus the natural log or the natural log of minus, right? Versus CA, right? So when we did that, we have the slope and the intercept. And so if the slope is 2.05, well, we know that the reaction order is not 2.05. We have to use a little bit of common sense when we do this. And so we know then that alpha A is equal to two, okay? So we also then from the intercept, if the intercept is equal to the natural log of K1, well, our instinct here is to say that the natural log of K1 is equal to minus 4.29. And if we did that, we would find that K1 equals 0 0.137. And I'm leaving the units out here. They don't matter for our, our discussion right now. But that also assumes a slope of 2.05. You also can go back and do the exact same thing, but set the slope. So you actually could go ahead and plot um, something very similar. You could actually plot the natural log of minus delta CA over delta T times two times the natural log of CA or versus, sorry. And that would set your slope. And then you would be able to measure the intercept there. And that was times um, K1. So you could find K1, which the actual K1 for this particular process is equal to 0 0.125 approximately, okay? And our intercept is two. Now this is pretty close. Um, and some people would just use this. Some people would then go ahead and force the slope to be two. Um, you also can do that in data analysis software as well. You could say, I'm gonna force the slope to be two and find the intercept that best fits the data. So that's another way to think about doing this as well. And quite honestly, that is the differential method. Now it has a fundamental problem and that is the step size here. You have to take small steps it's just like when we talked about implementing Euler's method. If you take steps that are really, really, really big, um, it ends up really messing with you and um, getting nonsense data because you're not having fine enough increments. So taking a lot of data can also be expensive. So we need a way around this. We need a way around taking a lot of expensive data. And that is the integral method. Okay, so this is the second. Uh, way that people do this. Now for the integral method, I'm going to tell you all we're doing is looking for a straight line. Okay, that's all we're trying to do. So let's just do a little math and I'll show you what I mean. So let's say, let's start with an assumption that we had a zeroth order reaction. Those do exist. Um, and in fact, the example I gave a minute ago where the concentration of B was so much bigger than A would appear like a zeroth order reaction if you tried to take the data. Um, but what that means is that DCA DT would be equal to minus K1 times CA to the zero. Well, that's just equal to K1, right? Or minus K1. So if we solve this problem, this is actually very easy. This just means DCA equals K1 times DT. And if we integrated this, which is why it's called the integral method, it would be very simple. You get CA minus CA zero equals K1 times T or CA equals CA zero minus K1 times time. And so we're gonna plot the concentration of A versus time in this for a zeroth order reaction. 
And if it's a straight line, you are correct. It is a zeroth order reaction. If it's not a straight line, we have to do something else. So let's do the same thing for a first order reaction, which we've already solved before. So if you remember, right, when we had DCA DT was equal to minus K1 times CA to the first power, we already solved this, right? And the solution to this was that CA is equal to CA zero times the exponent of minus K1 times T, okay? If we take the natural log, the natural log of CA equals the natural log of CA zero minus K1 times T. And now if we plot the natural log of CA versus time, we should get a straight line, right? And it's very easy to plot CA versus time and to plot the natural log of CA versus time. And so if this is the case, right? If the natural log of CA versus time is a straight line, the reaction is first order. Well, what if zeroth order doesn't work and first order doesn't work? Well, what about a second order reaction? We're gonna do the exact same thing here and this will be the last one that we do. So for a second order reaction, we know that DCA then DT would equal minus K1 times CA squared, right? All right, if that's the case, well, we to solve this, right? This is DCA over CA squared equals minus K1 times DT. And we're gonna integrate this, right? From CA zero to CA, and we're gonna integrate this side from zero to T, right? And if we do that, the integral of one over CA squared is minus one over CA. So this is minus one over CA evaluated from CA zero to CA is equal to K one times time, right? Actually just doing that integral. Well, this is minus one over CA minus a negative one over CA zero equals and sorry, that's negative, equals minus K1 times T. And if I multiply everything by minus one, this becomes one over CA minus one over CA zero equals K1 times time, or one over CA equals one over CA zero plus K1 times T. And so now if I plot, one over CA versus time and get a straight line, it is a second order reaction. And so one of the things that we would do then is let's say that we had a second data set like we have um, here, right? I'm gonna use the same data that I used just a minute ago when we used the differential method. And I'm just gonna show you these plots. So if I show you the first plot, right, for a zeroth order reaction, I plotted the concentration of A versus time. Obviously, that's the one on the left here. That's not a straight line, right? It has a very poor R squared value. Um, and you can see it doesn't match the data well. So it's not a first order reaction. If it were or a second or zeroth order reaction, if it were a first order reaction, the natural log of CA versus T would be a straight line. And I plotted that. And you can see the fit looks okay but somewhere in the middle, it doesn't quite capture the, the shape. You know, there's a real difference between looking at an R square valued and saying, yeah, 0.97 is pretty close and really looking at the shape of a plot. And you can see here at the fringes, it's definitely not capturing the behavior and even in the middle. So it, it's not great. And I would look at that and say, yeah, that R square value is not good enough for me to stop there and say that it's linear. And so if, then if you plot one over CA versus T, we can see very, very clearly that R square value is excellent and that the, um, the data is very, very, very well captured here. And the other thing that we notice here is that in our uh, integral method for a second order reaction, the intercept, right? So, um, is the initial concentration or one over the initial concentration and the slope is equal to K1.
So I can actually use the slope of this line here to find that K1 was 0 0.0124. And so you tend to get very accurate measurements for Ks. You don't have to do any of kind of the refitting you do for the differential method. So I like the integral method, but it has its own intrinsic problem. You have solutions for integers that are very easy to find. It does not estimate fractional orders very well. So if you end up doing this and none of them fit, you might have to take more data and try the, the differential method. And you guys will get practice doing this for a reaction in the last problem of the homework that's due. There is, um, there is experimental data and fitting of that experimental data to uh, determine the reaction order and the reaction rate constant.